Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks morning. so much for joining us for this webinar. Um, Estelle is going to kick things off in just a minute, but we'd like to let uh, a couple of minutes go by for everyone to load in. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you in the beginning that um, we have some wonderful questions that were already sent in for the minister and the department uh, in the past uh, 24 hours, uh, but we certainly uh, will answer. Please go into the Q&A uh, instead of the chat. It's much easier for us to see and to um, answer your questions and, and mark them off whether we've answered them or whether we're gonna answer them live um, in the Q&A. Uh, the chat is amazing and we typically reserve that for us giving you links and information. Uh, Hugo is gonna be dropping some links in uh, that were just emailed to us this morning from uh, the department uh, in Victoria, uh, but uh, please try to put your questions in the Q&A. So I think we, have stabilized out at, uh, at a very good number of people. Uh, it doesn't seem to be jumping too much at the moment. So um, if uh, Estelle, if you will take over. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, um, Wes. Hi all and welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, as Wes said, thank you for submitting your questions prior to today. I will be ans um, asking the questions a little bit further into the um, session and I might just uh, paraphrase them for brevity, so please forgive me for that. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Restaurant and Catering Association acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Um, I'd like to introduce our special guest, the Honourable uh, Martin Pakula MP. Thank you and your support team for joining us today and giving us your time. Um, we also have two others joining us from the Industry Coordination Recovery Group. Um, hello, Barbara and Joseph, who's um, got video off at the moment, but um, they will be, there we are. Hello, Joseph. Um, we also have Wes, our uh, CEO of Restaurant Catering Australia, and Hugo joining us to our manager for policy and government. Um, a few little housekeeping things. I know Wes has touched on this already, um, but please use the Q&A um, section today for all questions and things that we're putting to the minister. Uh, we'll uh, invite um, Barbara and um, Joseph, if you'd like to answer in the Q&A, you're welcome to today. I think Hugo and Wes will also be popping answers into that Q&A section. Um, I think, that's really all I need to go over. I know we've only got um, the minister here for about 30 minutes, so I don't want to waste too much time, but we'll jump straight into it. Um, did you want to say a few words first, Minister? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Estelle. I think, can everybody hear me? All right. So Joseph, wave hello, and and Barb. Um, any questions um, uh, that, uh, that are that relate to sort of the discussions between our department and health, um, I'll probably throw to the team because they're the ones who are having those discussions. Um, I'll just speak briefly because I think we want to leave the greatest opportunity for people to ask questions. Look, the, the first thing um, uh, I'd say is that as, as the person in the, in the um, Coordinating Ministers Committee who's um, charged with representing this sector, and I should I should add my thanks to Minister Pulford, uh, the Small Business Minister, and and the Treasurer, um, who are also um, very supportive. You know this this has been a very difficult eighteen months, um, and it remains very difficult. There are you know obviously competing um, views. There are competing imperatives. Uh, the Department of Health, understandably. Um, uh, is very concerned about the strain on the hospital system, both uh, that is undergoing at the moment and that is to come. Um, we are seeing a very high caseload, uh, but we're also seeing a very high vaccination rate. The positive thing, and I think the thing that people can take comfort from, is that despite our numbers going from, you know, the 400s to the 900s to the 1400s to the 1800s in the last couple of weeks, um, there's no divergence from the roadmap. Um, at, at a point in time, I think that sort of uptick in numbers could easily have led to um, uh, a delay, but there's no sign of that occurring. The Premier's been very resolute about our need to now vaccinate our way out of this and to push through the, the current situation um, and to get to 70 and then 80%. So that's... Um, uh, one positive. The second positive, I think, is that our vaccination numbers are growing very quickly. So we're seeing upwards of 90,000 
doses being administered daily at the moment, and that's seeing our second dose um, percentage increase. Uh, we, we're now up to almost 1% a day. Um, I think, in fact, yesterday, slightly more than that. So I think we're going to hit those numbers a little bit quicker, um, a little bit more quickly than we imagined that we would. So that's another positive. And um, the third positive that I just want to mention is uh, everybody is focused on phase C, that is 80%. And I know, I'll say at the ad, so I know that the settings at 80% are not what you would like them to be. And they're not necessarily what I would like them to be, that they, they are where they are. Um, uh, the point is, I don't think phase C is going to last very long. So, um, you know, if, if you think of the next phase being when we get to 80%, 12 plus, um, that, that will probably happen only days after 80%, 16 plus, maybe as, as little as a week. So we've got a great opportunity to focus on that next, that next step, what comes after phase C, uh, because phase C is going to be a very short phase. Um, in less kind of, um, in, you know, I, I, am, I am keenly aware of the fact that particularly the settings at 70 are not uh, as you would like them and they are not as, um, they are not as, uh, as, as open, let's say, as the settings in New South Wales at 70. Having said that, we don't know yet what the Sydney settings are going to mean for Sydney and we'll be able to watch that in a, as, a real, as a real world example in the next few days. Uh, and they are what public health um, uh, has been prepared to accede to, and that is a reality that we are all operating within. Uh, and so, you know, we are we are engaged in very much a a back and forth that goes for many many rounds. And um, you can rest assured that we are pushing as hard as we can um, in regards to uh, trying to get um, the best settings that we can for business. Uh, we're going to have the vaccinated economy trial start in a few locations in regional Victoria next week. There'll be a few hospitality settings in there. Um, so that will be an, an opportunity to see how that works. We're not uh, in any way uh, underestimating the potential, um, you know, potential flashpoints when it comes to um, uh, ensuring that only vaccinated people um, uh, enter hospitality venues. Uh, but we'll work our way through that. Um, there's, there's, there's lots of other examples where, you know, whether it's um, responsible service of alcohol, whether it's um, ensuring that, you know, only, only age appropriate people are in venues, ensuring that only regional people are in regional venues. We've already got a number of, I suppose, opportunities for people to get upset um, and, and most establishments are pretty well um, you know, they understand pretty well how to deal with uh, with people like that. It might get a little bit willing for a while on vaccinations, but the number of unvaccinated people is diminishing all the time. Um, you know, the number of people, I think at some point we'll get to a point where the, the number of people in the community above 16 years of age who are unvaccinated will be as low as 5 to 10%. It will be, be a very small cohort, but they'll be a very aggro cohort um, to some extent. So... Oh, um, you know, we're, and we're not we're not um, we're not unsympathetic to that problem, um, uh, but there's only so many things that can be done about it. I might just um, stop there, uh, Wes and Estelle, and um, uh, leave it to uh, to your members to ask some questions. Yeah. So, right. Estelle, so Estelle's going to ask some questions that were asked uh, prior to the release of the directions this morning. Uh, I think those uh, most of those questions are still relevant. And then we'll uh, try to get into the Q and A. There are certainly uh, a couple of really um, poignant questions. We have typed in uh, answers uh, for questions that are clearly answered in the roadmap. Um, as the minister said, the roadmap has not changed. So if the answer is in the roadmap, uh, asking a speculative question about is it going to change, uh, there there won't be an answer to that question. Um, as well as questions of why, uh, certainly um, the, the I can answer the why, but it won't. <laughs> Why, why, people won't like it. <laughs> the, the, the chief health officer has, uh, and the you know the uh, government in um, in Victoria uh, have made these decisions based upon that public health advice. Uh, and certainly, we would love to answer the whys. But this uh, this uh, webinar would go on much further than thirty minutes. So over now to I you. I can give a generic why, and then we can. Then that, that probably answers all the whys. <laughs> okay. Over to you, yes. sir. 
Thanks, Wes. And just a note as well that um, when the Minister does have to jump off, we will stay on for a Restaurant and Catering Association to answer some of those specific roadmap questions. Um, we're going to the kind of the broader questions at the moment. So I'll jump into them now, if you like. Uh, this question is from Duncan. Uh, part of the roadmap states that restaurants will first open with outdoor dining only. Will those restaurants with no outdoor dining still receive government support while we're still restricted to takeaway only? So we've we've already outlined um, we've already outlined the support um, that will apply until we get to phase C. Um, so uh, the current licensed hospitality venue fund will remain in place until seventy uh, percent, and from seventy percent until eighty percent. Uh, in metropolitan Melbourne, it will reduce by a quarter and in regional Victoria, it will reduce by 50% because in regional Victoria, there is indoor. I think it's 30 and 100. And in metro Melbourne, it's 50 outdoor. Um, so it will go, if you're on 20,000 for that fortnight, and we only expect that 70 to 80% period to be a fortnight at most, maybe as short as 10 days, uh, it'll come down from... Uh, 5, 10, 20 to uh, 4, hang on, take off a quarter, uh, 3, 7, 5, 0, oh, uh, 7 and a half and 15 for that, for, per week for, for that period. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Karina. Uh, without indoor density quotient two, uh, masks, vertical consumption and unlimited dance floors, the recovery of the wedding industry is dead in the water. Can these be guaranteed when we move to the national plan phase D in late November? Yeah, so uh, this goes back to the point that I um, made earlier uh, about phase D will be upon us very quickly. We actually, I think we could be at phase D as early as 9, 10 November, maybe sometime between the 9th and the 15th, because the 80% 12 and over is only a few days behind 80% 16 and over. We haven't yet arrived at the settings for phase D and there will be another phase after D because, um, you know, D will be one thing, E will be probably, you know, E might be, for instance, you might have an, an 85%, you know, setting and you might even have a 90% setting. I am keenly aware and I have, you know, I, and that that uh, there there is a point where in terms of getting more and more people vaccinated, we're, you know, we're, we, we're kind of done. There'll obviously be booster shots, but I wouldn't call it a forever setting because nothing's forever, but there's a point where everyone's got to be able to get back and trade um, profitably. Um, and so we need, we like, I, I will be, I can't tell you what those settings will be because they're still to be discussed, debated um, and landed. Um, but I'm mindful of the need for better density quotients. I'm mindful of the need for higher caps or no caps. I'm mindful of the need for standing consumption. I'm mindful of the need for live music venues to be able to survive. Um, I'm mindful of the need um, for, um, for, for functions and events. So um, I can't tell you what those settings will be today because there's still to be, there's all that wrangling and that pushing and pulling and, the, you know, yes, we'll have very high vaccination rates, but it's also quite likely we'll have very high case numbers at that point. Um, and so that always, you know, there's always the push and pull around that. But I'll, you know, I will be, um, you know, I am mindful that you can't necessarily run a profitable wedding um, business, events business, when you can't have more than 150 people indoors. And that's the current phase C maximum, unless you're, you know, uh, unless it's, you know, a state significant venue. Um, and, and so we need better density quotients and we need higher caps or no caps. You know, I, I think in New South Wales, they're looking at a, at, at a provision which is about DQs, not about caps. So the bigger the venue, the higher the, the, higher the, uh, the number. Um, and that's the kind of thing that's informing the positions that I'm putting, uh, but I can't give, uh, I, I obviously can't provide you with certainty about 
how that's all going to land. But um, don't, what, what I would urge people to do is not get too hung up on the settings that are in phase C, because phase C will be a very short phase. Thank you. That kind of leads into my next question, which is from Lisa, uh, and it's with regards to rapid antigen testing. Uh, when will we have access to this and be required to use it or have the option to use it in our venues to facilitate larger events? Yeah, look, um, I, I don't know whether the department wants to jump in on rapid antigen. I think um, we, we've just started, um, uh, look, it's, TGA has only just started making it available in, in a setting where you don't need um uh, effectively um, a, a nurse or someone trained by a nurse to administer it. Um, but it is something that is um, obviously much cheaper and much quicker than PCR testing. Uh, and we do see a role for it. Um, we're already talking about it playing a role in terms of um, home quarantining. Um, but maybe Joseph uh, or Barbara wants to add to some of the discussions with health about uh, how rapid antigen testing might be useful in the in, in these sorts of hospitality settings. Sure thing, Minister. Um, so basically, uh, we've just gone through the phase of endorsing the use of rapid antigen for surveillance testing in Victoria. That's um, um, as an alternative to wastewater in some of the settings that have been stipulated. Having said that, there's also guidance that's going to be released, hopefully, uh, in the next week or two, which will outline how it could be used as a screening tool for venues and events and workplaces. Um, and that'll sort of link to approved uh, test kits that are allowed to be used in Australia. And it'll be up to the uh, business to pick and choose off that available list. And then it's expected that it'll be funded by the business operator uh, for their screening needs. Um, so it's coming soon and uh, we'll share that information as soon as it becomes available. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, the next question um, is a, from Belinda. Um, I know we're wanting to really focus on phase D, but business health is really suffering. And we're wondering um, what the 70% roadmap for hospitality will look like, if you can provide any insight and when we can expect to have that information in health directions. Uh, well, that, look, the health directions, um, I'd need to go back and talk to health about when the directions come out. But in, ter in terms of the roadmap at, at phase B, 70%, um, uh, as I said, I think in metropolitan Melbourne, and, and, and you know, being mindful of the fact that we think, we expect phase B to be not much more than a fortnight from now. So we, we think we'll land there sometime like around October 23 is when we think we'll hit 70 uh, sometime between the 23rd and the 25th. And then we think we'll be at phase B for between 10 days and two weeks. Uh, and uh, the phase B settings, unless I, I'm, I'm pretty, it's, it's up to 50 outdoors. Um, fully vaccinated, yeah. Yeah, fully vaccinated in metropolitan Melbourne. And I think it's 30 indoors and 100 outdoors in regional Victoria. Now, um, where... Um, Minister Lean, who's the local government minister, and Minister Paul, the small business minister, will have more to say very soon about some more support for outdoor out, outdoor activation, um, uh, which is similar to what we did last year. I know that business would like um, uh, indoor dining at seventy, um, but uh, that's not that's not what the roadmap says, and it's not what public health advice provides us with. Um, all I can say to you is we, we are going to maintain, as I said before, licensed hospitality venue fund support through phase B until we get to phase C. We haven't yet decided what we'll do at phase C. Um, so there will be ongoing support uh, and we don't expect phase B or phase C to last very long. We think we'll be in phase D. You know, a month from now, we may well be in phase D. So Minister, on the back of that, and still before the next question, um, Minister or, um, or department, can you please clear up the question um, around uh, staff and patrons needing to be vaccinated and the mechanism to prove that as they enter a business? Yeah, so yes, well, yes, staff and patrons will need to be vaccinated. So we've already said in regards to permitted and authorised workers that um, one dose by October 15, right? And two doses, I think, by November 26. 
Um, and for patrons, um, uh, we well, once once we're opening doors, um, our expectation is that it'll be for double vax people only. Now, in terms of the methods of displaying that, we would expect that by next week, the service Vic app will have the interface with the Commonwealth vaccination um, status so that there'll be a way of scanning yourself in um, in the same way that you scan your QR code and a green tick will come up. Um, but in addition to that, um, there's the ability to download, as a lot of people already have, to your Apple wallet or from the MyGov website. Um, there's the ability to um, get a hard copy of your vaccination status from Services Australia. Uh, and there's an ability to get a medical exemption form as well. Now, whereas I know you sent to me, um, which I think is a very good thing, uh, that contraindication form that they're using in New South Wales, um, I have raised that with the relevant departments here so that that rather than a letter from a doctor is the sort of single um, point of truth. Uh, in terms of exemption, uh, I think they're still looking at that. At the moment, it's a. It's a, at the moment, I think it refers to a letter from a medical practitioner. Um, but there will be there will be a great clarity by the time you're open about what forms of. But I think I mean I've really gone through them. Um, mm -hmm. Your Apple Wallet, your your Medicare linked account, a hard copy. But for most people, it will be a scan um, through Service Victoria that will. Um, scan a green tick in the same way that your QR code scans now. Great, thank you. So uh, continue over to you, Estelle, and uh, but we know the minister is short on time. Yeah, great. Um, one of the questions um, that we've been having is that uh, many members have had trouble accessing appropriate amounts of support because of their uh, liquor licence um, not having patron numbers on it or their businesses being under one ABN but having six, seven, eight locations under that ABN. So it kind of falls under both of the funding um, realms. Um, I guess the question is, is there being anything done to um, fix these discrepancies? Well, the, the, AB, the ABN one is, um, is more difficult. Look, there's, there's no way that you can create a business support um, process, which is both um, relatively quick and automatic, uh, and, and which at the same time can deal with every kind of discrepancy. Um, the, the single ABN works perfectly in about 98, 99% of cases. You know, that, that's the way most businesses, we understand that there's some businesses with single ABNs and multiple venues. Um, in regards to the licensed hospitality, uh, in, in regards to patron numbers, we've had a number of those brought to our attention. Um, we've had, uh, um, uh, I, I would say, we've had a pretty um, flexible reaction to that. So we have, as they've come, we're not, we're not um, resolving that through a rule, if you like, because the rule has to be in place so that the majority of businesses can, can receive their payments in a, in a pretty untrammeled, uncomplicated way. But where a business is um, asserting that its real patron numbers are different to its um, liquor licence described patron numbers or where their liquor licence doesn't specify, um, we've been dealing with them on, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And in the... And, and, most of those that are coming to us are being resolved in favour of the business. So this happened last year as well. We either send someone down to have a look at the floor plan, we 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 get or we get um, other data, other information that might show the patron numbers more accurately, and we're resolving them on it. And we've resolved many, many, many of them. So I would say if you think that your um, that that. Um, there is an inaccuracy in your license that it doesn't demonstrate your true numbers. Uh, if you if you let us know, we, you know there's a there's a I, I won't call it bespoke, but there's a process to have that assessed. 
Okay, thank you. I've got one last question and then I'll hand it over to Wes to ask some of the questions out of the chat box that he thinks are appropriate. Um, our hospitality workforce has been considerably, considerably diluted by lack of international travel, constant reopening and closing and vaccination requirements. With large case numbers and the strain on contact tracing apparent, when will we, there be an updated test trace, isolate and quarantine information available to businesses? Yeah, re really soon. So you would have already seen that um, in New South Wales, I think they've recently announced that when they get to 70% double dose, which they've just arrived at, um, their, their isolate protocols will move from 14 days to seven. Um, I'm not in a position to announce our um, approach today, but I, I would say to you that um, it has probably overtaken business support as the single biggest issue that's being raised in every business setting, whether it's food manufacturing, hospitality, um, education, you name it. Um, as we get more and more people vaccinated, but more and more cases, uh, you can't be knocking every venue out or every person out when they're a close contact of a positive case for two weeks, because um, it doesn't take much of that for the place to grind to a halt. So we're looking very, you know, it's been a topic of conversation at almost every meeting. I've been raising it pretty consistently. I think we'll have something to say about it very, very soon. Beyond that, um, uh, there's also, I think you can keep an eye out for new protocols in regards to people coming into Victoria from interstate. Um, again, that will be not too far away. Um, you know, we, we, we've now got more cases than New South Wales. So, um, making it difficult for people to come across the border uh, makes less sense as the time goes on because um, it's not like we're trying to prevent an incursion of the virus at this stage. We are, however, still trying to keep it out of the regions as much as we can. So we've got to maintain a degree of care about that. Um, but we recognise that differentiation between Victoria and New South Wales at this point is um, of, let's say, marginal utility. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Where's over to you, please. Prime Minister, I'm going to go very fast. Because I know that, um, and some of these may be yes or no questions, uh, yes or no answers. Um, so the wedding industry uh, obviously uh, was a little bit confused by their section uh, because there wasn't an or put between the um, fully vaccinated and the uh, unvaccinated. So many operators believe that they can have unvaccinated people at a full wedding. Um, uh, if you could just provide a little bit of clarity in that section is uh, you can either have a fully vaccinated wedding with density restrictions and caps, or you can have a um, very small wedding with 10 people um, unvaccinated. They're not and, they're or. Yeah, I, yeah, uh, yeah well, well, without having it in front of me, logically they're an or. But okay. I might get um, Joseph to confirm that later. But there's not, yes, it's not, it's not 150 unvaccinated, or 150 vaccinated plus 10 unvaccinated. That is not the, um, that's not the Yeah, we, we thought so. And the next question about weddings is, can you dance at a wedding at any, at phase C or D? Well, we haven't got the D, we haven't got the D settings yet. So I can't, I can't answer definitively any of the questions about D. Um, can someone, uh, without the roadmap in front of me, uh, it's a very, very detailed roadmap, I'm sorry. So no, dancing is not addressed on the roadmap. That's why it's being asked, um, right. because it's not in the wedding section. Well, can, um, we come back to, can we come back to you on that, Wes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's, uh, that is certainly going to answer. And I think uh, what prompted those questions is because the, um, the uh, when brides call... Uh, all of the helpline numbers, or the um, you know the that's what I want to uh, know. Well, they all they all get different answers, um, and you know it is. I, I know that FAQs and you know answering down to the nth degree of questions is difficult, but but ultimately, uh, you know, we've become the single source of truth. And and if I, there is, I think a, the general, I think where's the general, the general rule is if you look at the restricted activity directions, if it's not barred, it's allowed. So wait and see the rads, but we'll but we'll get you an answer before then. <laughs> okay. So dancing has normally been addressed uh, as in previous roadmaps as being allowed or not allowed. Yeah. Um, and so since it's missing from 
the wedding and the hospitality section. Uh, we do know that um, we, we are a fortnight away from the road from 70%. Uh, and normally the public health orders come out in the days leading up to that. Yeah. We totally understand. Uh, we've, we're dealing with that in New South Wales at the moment. Um, so we do understand that. Uh, but uh, because weddings and events and functions have to be booked uh, months or years in advance, yeah. uh, it is important that um, in that middle period between 70 and 80, and even in the 80 um, of 16 plus before we get to the 80 of 12 plus, that yeah. uh, if possible, that we will uh, get you, we will get you an answer. Beautiful. Uh, also, uh, booking caps was not um, mentioned in the roadmap. Uh, do you believe that there'll be a booking cap number in hospitality? There, 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 ha there has been in the past. I mean, there's been booking caps of 10 or 20. Again, my, my imperative will be to have um, the least number of rules and restrictions possible. So, for instance, at C, um, quite frankly, if you can have 50 outside... Um, whether it's five type, whether it's five groups of 10, 20 groups of five, or two groups of 20 and one group of 10, I don't personally see that there's a huge reason for a, for a distinction there. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll it, look, it's some, sometimes it's better, um, it's almost better not to go and ask the question because if it hasn't been addressed by public <laughs> health in the roadmap, then quite frankly, asking the question may cause them to turn their mind to something that they have not yet turned their mind to. No, no, it's um, it's be careful what you wish for because then you get a patron cap. Uh, and look, we, we've practiced that many times uh, around the country yeah. is if it if it isn't, as you said, if it's not there, um, then yeah, it doesn't exist. Well, and but, the, you know, oftentimes someone thinks about it the day that the public health orders are being issued Correct. and all sudden it, it is magically in the public health orders. So it's really, um, you know, sometimes, especially in the case of things that are far out, uh, we we ask those. Um, well, I can ask if you want me to, Wes. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, look, look, it's six of one and a half does another. If it's not going to magically appear, if dancing and patron caps are not going to appear in the public health order, yeah. I think everyone on this call would rather that we didn't, you didn't ask. But if it's all of a sudden going to appear, then yeah, understand. You know, it, it understand. will have, especially because of the us potentially making uh, that 23rd, 24th, 25th date, uh, that does give some venues the ability to have some Melbourne Cup events uh, in advance of Melbourne Cup. You know, I know that and it, it was a disappointing, um, you know, I, I, you heard it here first. I'm fairly sure that we won't reach the 80% 16 plus by the 2nd of November, that would be a monumentous feat. Um, but certainly- I can tell you, Wes, right now, <laughs> right now, our um, our best estimate is it will get there on the 3rd of November. Well, there you go. So it's, yeah. you know, we it, it will, I, I call on all Victorians to go get uh, vaccinated. Just go, just go that little bit harder. Yeah, go that little bit harder. Uh, we know it slows down on the weekend, so the rate changes. But yeah. ultimately, um, you know, I, a couple of people have now asked that they would, they do need to know because they are, you know, potentially going to be making those bookings. And for some venues, um, you know, that they would prefer to book their entire outside to one group uh, for Melbourne Cup if possible. Yeah. So, you know, it's, understood. It, it, understood. Uh, it, you know, that we, I think you might need to ask the question. Um, the another question is. We know that there's going to be a QR code and a requirement, um, but will businesses still have to have a COVID safe marshal? Or will that morph into the the COVID vaccine check-in uh, employee? Ah, uh, look, I, 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 that that I that that's outside my purview. That will ultimately be a health requirement. But I mean, I would think that I, I would think that a COVID safe marshal and a person ensuring that vaccinated persons are entering only. I can't see any obvious reason why that should be two different people. That could probably be one person, but we can. That's something that we can prosecute. And uh, I've got Joseph with his hand up, and I, and I would just say, Wes, at that point, I'm probably going to have to scarpa as well. Okay. Well, so I, I do... might leave you in the capable hands of Joseph, and um, and thank you for your uh, for your questions. And you've got my number. Any other questions, Wes? 
um, either of your own or of your members, just send them through to me and um, we will get you answers. Thank you so much, Minister, for uh, uh, joining us today and uh, certainly is a help to the industry when they hear directly from you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So uh, to everyone who's still in the webinar, uh, we will stay here to continue answering questions. There are none in the Q&A. They were all uh, very much, um, uh, what is the word? They were all very similar. Many people had questions about uh, the um, test, trace, and isolate. Now, what we can say, and um, Joseph uh, certainly will reiterate that this is something that the uh, Victorian government and the department is working on feverishly. But what we will convey, because we're a national organization, is that in New South Wales, for example, um, if you are a fully vaccinated venue, staff and patrons, um, it is even if you come in contact with someone who's positive, uh, following a process uh, of testing and waiting for the result, in New South Wales, uh, you go back to work the next day. Uh, and in New South Wales, you don't have to notify New South Wales Health until you have three positive cases uh, in your premise. So look, Victoria will likely do it slightly differently. However, there has been a difference uh, in New South Wales between um, the track, trace and isolate and deep clean and closing your business uh, in previous lockdowns and reopenings. So we do expect that uh, in Victoria, hopefully, uh, those metrics will change, especially with businesses that are fully vaccinated uh, and that that close contact will change to casual and low risk, which is what has happened. Uh, I see Joseph shaking his head. So those rules are not yet published yet. And uh, so we expect those to be closer to the time of the public health order. Um, and uh, Hugo, you have your hand up. So uh, yeah, I think one thing that we should probably talk about is uh, about last night's uh, release of the mandatory vaccination worker directions. Um, I think that's really important for all our members to understand and, and Restaurant Catering will send uh, an, an email after this webinar uh, discussing what that actually means for you and your workers. But basically at 11.59 last night, the government uh, in Victoria issued uh, hospitality workers as, uh, along with other listed workers uh, they will be required to show evidence of their vaccination to their employer by a certain date. Uh, so from 15 of October 2021, in order to work on site at a premises, authorised workers must be able to provide evidence to an employer that they have received at least one dose of COVID-19 or have a booking to receive your first dose by the 22nd of October or a medical exemption evidenced by an authorised medical practitioner. So that means that uh, from the 23rd of October onwards, uh, you need to have received your, your first dose at least uh, as a, and to attend work. Um, and then from the 26th of November, you'll be required to provide evidence to your employer that you have received your second dose, unless you have a medical exemption, to attend work. Um, so basically that, that entails, you know, work premises is anywhere that you're required to work uh, outside of your home. Uh, so I would be encouraging all employers to talk to their um staff about this these changes which are coming out and I will put the directions from the acting chief health officer in the chat now so that you can have a look at it um, and just go through yourself and, and see and see what this applies to you but it pretty much applies to all hospitality workers and their employers to enter that premises you must have a single dose by a certain day and then a double dose by a certain day and that will all be outlined in an email that we will be seeing to all of you after this also just you add to that as well sorry um Wes, to interrupt, um, but included in that email, we will also send out templates of how to record the um, citation of your employee um, vaccination status, as well as some suggested wording and things on how to approach both uh, employees and patrons on um, discussing vaccination status. Um, I know uh, the Minister mentioned things like RSA, and I think we need to empower our staff that this is a very, very similar conversation um, that is supported by a law and a legal framework um, and to really lean on those the, the, those terms in supporting our team and training them. I might just answer a quick, quick question that's come through live and that is what are the requirements for providing takeouts and can someone non-vaccinated still be served? So an unvaccinated patron can be served takeaway, yes, but the person serving that takeaway must be vaccinated. 
So there, there is a question uh, that um, has, has continued to pop up. Uh, if you are having problems with your licensed venue and the hospitality fund, uh, please send those uh, questions in an email to, and Hugo's going to be mad at me, hugo at rca.asn.au. Um, if we can intervene, uh, if you have, if your appeal has failed, or if, you know, if you're having trouble uh, getting a hold of someone in the department to have a look at uh, your uh, capacity, um, we'll certainly help as much as we can. Uh, but uh, normally the department does not talk to us about individual cases. Um, so, you know, ultimately it is case by case. Uh, so there isn't a blanket answer to that question, uh, but we can help you if you feel like you've exhausted all, all issues. Um, there, there certainly were a handful of exceptions that, um, that we can help you with. So um, we have run out of, of questions in the Q&A. Uh, certainly, um, for the avoidance of doubt, and my phone has already been blowing up this morning, hospitality falls into retail. So if you scroll down quickly on the, uh, the uh, resources that were sent out this morning uh, by the department, you would have not seen hospitality or restaurant. Uh, if you click on retail and scroll down, it does say uh, all food service businesses. Uh, so for the avoidance of doubt, uh, restaurants, cafes, caterers fall in retail. Second, you have the legal obligation to check the status of your employee's vaccine. They cannot give you an excuse of privacy or discrimination. There is a public health order, which is a lawful direction, which allows you both under the state laws and federal law to request your employee prove their vaccine status, first or second. And if they are unable to or refuse to provide you with that vaccine status, then they are unavailable to work. So it is as if they did not turn up for their shift. And Fair Work has provided lots of uh, information around what happens when an employee is not available to work. You are not uh, disciplining them as an employee because they are or are not vaccinated. And please do not say that to the employee. You are disciplining them through the uh, fair work system because they are unavailable to work in your venue. So it is very important that your verbiage is correct to your employees, but also uh, they cannot refuse to show you a medical exemption. It can't just be verbal. Uh, and they can't just verbally tell you that they have had that first vaccination or they're doubly vaccinated. Uh, it has to be citing. And typically you need to cite it every time they come in. I know that's, that's onerous, but uh, it's just for, uh, for compliance measures uh, that you certainly are always aware uh, that your employees have followed that public health order, which is legal. It is a legal direction uh, and certainly a requirement. Now, all of a sudden there have been quite a few questions. Um, do you need to check the, uh, yep, Estelle is answering that. Okay, happy days. Um, so Hugo has now raised his hand again, go ahead. Yeah, I thought I'd just also throw to Joseph. Um, Joseph, I've been in, in a bunch of uh, uh, webinars of yourself and, and you seem to be the absolute expert on the, on the matter, which is uh, very reassuring. Um, I was wondering if you had any comments that you'd like to give to our members about what they should expect with the reopening and little things to look out for. And, you know, if there's any loose ends that you'd like to tie up from what we've said today, um, I think you, your input would be insanely beneficial. Oh, thank you, Hugo. And thanks everyone and Wes for putting this on. So effectively, uh, what we anticipate, I know there was a the discussion earlier about COVID marshals and COVID check-in marshals um, is the other terminology. I know it's a bit confusing, unfortunately, that's the terminology the government come up with. Um, so the COVID check-in marshal is effectively any staff member who is sort of announced, uh, you know, deputized to check people as they come in for QR code scanning, but they would also automatically assume the role of checking the vaccine status, the green tech, if you like. Um, and for the people who don't have a phone, that's going to be the, the issue, you know, there might be like maybe 10% of the population that struggle with that app option. Um, so they may be required to carry a, you know, printed certificate or the Medicare app is the alternative. 
Um, so, so there will be methods and we'll put get FAQs up. So stay tuned for FAQs. I think that's going to be your, you know, your ultimate guide. And if you do get, say, an authorized officer come and inspect your property and say, you know, are you doing all of these things? And if you have a query that you want to um, address, then I think check the FAQs as a starting point because a lot of those things probably would have come up earlier. Um, the other thing that might become interesting, uh, and I say this because it's being looked at currently, is ventilation. So uh, ventilation in indoor settings is going to be quite an important feature, I think, uh, post, post this reopening. And not just here, but around the world, it's being looked at. So I think that's one to watch out for. We just went through an exercise with the construction industry with the tea rooms saga, and that was so we were able to negotiate a position which allowed the tea rooms to be used with additional ventilation guidelines. And that still didn't give sort of, you know, um, you know full use in the normal sense, but there are, there are sort of still restrictions in place and hygiene requirements, which are quite onerous, uh, but we anticipate that will be a feature. The, uh, so the chicken marshal doesn't really need training. It's really just a, you know, a chicken role, but the COVID marshal will still need to be trained. And if you're currently in settings where there's a COVID marshal being used, um, it's likely they'll still be in place by the time we get to the reopening. The um, rapid antigen was the other one that we've touched on briefly, but again, that could be used as a screening tool. And it could also be spun around positively as a, you know, reassurance for your customers. You know, you come in, you're in a safe environment because it's noting the fact that even if you're vaccinated, you can still get the virus and pass it on to people. And there's still, you know, children, for instance, who can't get vaccinated. So you could pass it on to vulnerable kids. Um, so, you know, giving that reassurance is going to be useful. Hope that's uh, helpful, Hugo. Mate, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, were there any final comments that Wes or Estelle had? I, mean, I think we have two more questions in the Q&A session. I don't know if they're being typed to an answer or was there anything else that Estelle always would like to add? So the question is uh, requirement for fully vaxxed customers. At the moment, it's 16 plus. Um, that's um, because 12 plus is not uh, yet uh, considered eligible uh, in Victoria. So it is, um, it is 16 plus, both for staff and for, uh, for patrons. So for example, if you're in a fast food business and you have staff that are 14 years, nine months, up to 15 years, 363 days, uh, they wouldn't have to provide you with their status. Um, uh, is it, is it, there's a question there about, uh, there was mention of unvaccinated children being permitted with vaxxed adults. I know that's a similar situation what we have in New South Wales. Um, is that going to be the case, Joseph? Yeah, that's fine um, because they're not eligible for the vaccine yet. So, but they will be counted as, if there's a cap limit, then they'll still be counted as a person. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, 12 months and below won't be counted in that cap limit as it was previously. Oh, yes, babies, of course. Um, I meant, yeah, other children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I just know I'm going to get asked that question, so I just wanted to get it out of the way. <laughs> so so there, there's an operational question, um, and meaning how, how is the restaurant going to operate with um, checking status? Uh, what we noted is that, um, that let's say you're a small coffee shop and you have only, you know, four or six or eight seats and maybe two or three outside. Um, the first time you're gonna see a customer is the, at the point of sale. And you know, for example, normally you give them a number for them to sit down to wait or to uh, for dine in versus they stand and wait for the takeaway. It is important that businesses begin thinking about how they're going to, to do that because to sit down, they will need to have been checked for their vaccine status. Um, so we have team members who are 15, and when I called the COVID hotline, they said these team members will need to be vaccinated to be able to work. Is this correct? So over to you, Joseph. So it'll be the 16 plus rule will apply. So um, they've got to be eligible um, to be vaccinated first. So it's an equity thing. And, but that'll you know, catch up pretty soon because 12 plus will be eligible uh, come you know, end of November or thereabouts or mid-November. Yeah, totally understand. So um, uh, I have the, um, the roadmap, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the 
release that came out today open. And it says that employers will be subject to large fines uh, if their employees are not, um, if proof hasn't been provided uh, and they're at the workplace. Do we know what the penalty units uh, will be yet? Um, it says here, you will face a penalty of up to 120 penalty units, $21,808 or 600 penalty units and $109,000 if you're a corporation. Um, are, are those the penalties? Is it that steep a penalty uh, to, for non-compliance? I think that that's at the severe end. Um, there will be an FAQ on it. I think I briefly saw one this morning. Um, it's there. And, and, and I think the, the message there is, you know, the punishment is severe if you've got people sort of, you know, uh, defrauding the system or just willful non-compliance. Um, but there'll be a level of reasonableness, you know, with, with the workplace as, as they've always been. So, um, but there'll be a zero tolerance on people sort of flouting the, the rules, of course. Uh, much harsher than ever before on this particular issue. Okay, well, that, that certainly clears that up. There had been a lot of questions around, oh, well, they're not, nothing's going to happen, you know, that I, and, uh, you know, they're not going to, to, um, to enforce this, um, you know, ultimately. Uh, so if a customer, so ultimately, if a customer comes in, your, tries to come in your business, that, you don't know that they're takeaway and delivery or click and collect until you engage with them. So if, an if a customer can't prove to you that they're vaccinated, they shouldn't be able to sit down. So it's kind of your business is the gatekeeper. So if they're sitting down and they're unvaccinated, well, that's your fault as a business, right? It's you will need to have either checked at the door at the POS uh, or, um, or at, you know, at the, the uh, outset, excuse me, at worst case scenario is, is when they're sitting down. So they'll have been in your venue already. So it is important to come up with a process. We understand that many of you are small businesses and that you'll need to do it at the POS because that's the first time that you know if they're just doing click and collect or if they're doing uh, uh, sit down. It's best as close to the door as possible because that's where the QR code uh, normally would be on your front door per the state requirements. Uh, and least best is uh, when they're sitting down if you have a venue where you normally uh, address the customer for the first time at the table. As an extension to that as well, if you have someone come into your venue to get takeaway and then proceed to sit down at a table outside, um, so you're under the um, impression that they were getting a takeaway and then they were to sit down, you would then need to check their vaccination status. They cannot get takeaway and then sit outside at your venue or inside at your venue. Um, just to add that one. So there is a question about food courts, and that is a more retail question, but I'm sure that Joseph can answer. Um, who is responsible for food courts uh, inside malls or, uh, or shopping areas? So it'll be the mall operator. So if you are, um, you know, uh, sitting down in that area, the expectation will be that there will be a COVID check-in marshal type role roaming around, ensuring that everyone seated would, would have been cross-checked. Uh, is my expectation. Of course, food courts aren't open in Metro Melbourne yet, um, and we'll certainly have FAQs and stuff, which will address that. Awesome. So uh, does anyone else have questions for Joseph? He is the, he is the uh, single source of truth from the department, and he has answered so many questions uh, for myself and for Estelle and for Hugo. And on, uh, I, I have lost count at the number of uh, of Zoom meetings that he has called. I think that that is now his new official job is uh, officiating the Zoom calls for all of the- uh, the um, Industry associations. Industries, yeah, industry associations. And, and you're doing an amazing job, um, certainly not taking anything personal uh, and keeping a smile on your face. Um, you, Wes. So there's a question about uh, private security. Uh, and so, People who come to your workplace, uh, which normally might not work for you, might be labor hire and come to your workplace, uh, not necessarily employed by you directly, but employed by labor hire. Um, will they still be subject to vaccine requirements because they're working in your premise? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> so we've, um, and I can give you the example of construction industry where it's heavily subcontractor based and 
it's a requirement on the, the prime contractor or the site operator to ensure that all workers on site, even if they're subcontractors, are complying. And that they could work two ways. Either they could, when they arrive, they can, as, the, as a customer would, demonstrate that they're vaccinated, you know, with the app, for example. Or you could have a pre-arrangement with the, their employer where they provide evidence before the commencement of their shift or contract period. So you could arrange it either way. And that evidence record needs to be held by, you know, because you're employing them as a subcontractor of sorts, um, that, that evidence needs to be recorded by the business operator for that. So I've just, got, I've just gotten a, um, a que two questions asked at the same time. Um, in terms of weddings. So for the avoidance of doubt, at a wedding or an event, the checking of the vaccine status in final is at the entrance to the event itself. Okay. I so, would say so because logic would have it. You wouldn't really want, uh, you know, uh, people congregating and then sort of checking at the end. Um, and, and, you know, that, that could be deemed as sort of, not doing due diligence and that'll ultimately be the responsibility of the venue operator um and so there might be some delineation of the who's running the event as opposed to who owns the venue so i think it's important to have that conversation with the um, the people that are renting out a space for instance to ensure that those checks and balances are in place a venue um collect that vaccination to the event and store it as they would an employee's records for the sake of haste um, on arrival. Have 150 people arriving for a large event at the same time. Would it be um, better for them to gather it cited over Zoom or all that, those kind of processes and store that in the similar register? Yeah, look, um, so if you've got an event organiser that's booking um, a venue, say, in a hotel or somewhere, um, then the organiser would be expected to provide that data to the venue operator, ideally ahead of time if you've got a lot of people coming, um, like a spreadsheet that records everyone's vaccine status and how it was cited or, you know, as much <laughs> information as possible. Well, you're not required to ask them for copies of certificates for hundreds of, of people, uh, right. but it's just that record. So you're effectively expecting them to abide by the law. And, um, and the alternative is to check in at the door for each person. So you could do it either way or hybrid for anyone who hasn't got that. So you could have a guest list at the entrance and just tick them off and, and get the ones that are not in the list to provide verification at the door. Thank you. That's great. Just remember, as a business, you are the responsible party. So you are responsible for ensuring that anyone that's entering your premise, um, that is both indoor or outdoors, because it is your premise, whether it's an outdoor on your property or whether it's indoors, it's still your premise. Um, you, you need to ensure that you have uh, taken reasonable efforts. The word reasonable has been thrown around uh, quite a lot. Um, reasonable efforts to ensure that you know, if uh, health or, um, or an authorized uh, enforcer of the public health order asks you that you have your COVID safe plan in place, showing this is what we do, this is what we always do. Um, we get a pre list of who is, uh, and then we spot check or we, uh, we require at the door anyone who uh, has been added to the guest list or otherwise um, you know, you certainly don't want to be, call, be called out. Uh, remember the events that happened in Victoria during lockdown that garnered three hundred thousand and million dollars in fines. Uh, you know, ultimately, we do not want any of your venues or your businesses to be on the front page of the Herald or the Age or you know in the news. It's it's never good. Uh, so just following these easy steps, um, you know, to ensure that uh, you've just uh, taken a reasonable effort to ensure that guests and patrons and staff are vaccinated, uh, will certainly keep you out of trouble. If it's probably the only instance where you sort of don't have that sort of requirement will be like you've called in an ambulance because someone's just had a heart attack in the menu. You know, you don't stop the ambulance workers uh, from going through for that reason, you know? So there, there are certain very limited exceptions to the rule. Yeah, so it's, I, I think, um, I think what, what's happened is previous lockdowns pre-Delta 
had their own set of rules in place and people got very used to those rules. And what we found is um, a lot of the same questions or uh, assumptions are being made. But as the minister said, and you said, and, and Barb said, this particular strain and this particular lockdown and this particular reopening isn't at all like previous lockdowns, strains and reopenings. And the answers to those older questions uh, for the most part do not apply. Um, someone asked about you know, being able to sign uh, you know, a piece of paper that, that says to the venue that I'm vaccinated with no proof. Uh, that's no longer allowed. You have to be able to prove through one of very limited sources that you have been vaccinated. And, and what we experienced in New South Wales, and I know it's going to make some of the regional participants of the call uh, a, a little bit angry, is that in New South Wales, the regions went backwards. So meaning that from Monday the 11th, the regions in New South Wales are going to be under more restrictions than they're under today as the entire state comes under the vaccination mandate and under the density and, uh, and other caps that are now becoming statewide. Uh, Joseph, do you expect that the entire state of Victoria will likely move lockstep into that 70 and 80 at 16 and 80 at 12? And it may mean that some regional areas will seem to be going a little backwards before they go forwards again. Yeah, absolutely. So as we get closer to that November sort of time period, that's when the two uh, will come together. Obviously, Metro is still under lockdown condition, right? So, um, and that'll that'll merge. And I think there'll be a lot of cross-learning, uh, particularly into phase D and, um, and ho hopefully normalisation across Australia, at least between New South Wales and Victoria to start with, where a lot of the settings will be quite similar. And, um, and I think... That's a good thing to look forward to. <laughs> so we should expect tourism and stuff at least pick up between the two states after that period or after, yeah, beyond December. No, it is certainly the regions that uh, have less health resources. Uh, they have less ICU beds, less hospitals. And it, it, is, it is frustrating, right? That we, we're certainly frustrated, um, but we do understand that there will be a step backwards before there are step forwards in the regions. Um, and it, you know, it certainly doesn't seem like it makes sense, but we realize that with 1,838 cases and the minister assuring us that the roadmap is going to continue forward, that it is very important that, um, that there is a unified uh, public health order that does apply to the entire state uh, because people will be allowed to move around uh, more freely around the state from the greater Melbourne to the regions, uh, similar to here in New South Wales, um, you know, as soon as we hit 80%, you'll be able to travel to the regions, which means that areas that have never had COVID will likely get COVID and certainly will require high-risk businesses and high-risk venues to be fully vaccinated. Um, the questions are, uh, we've already answered the, um, the venue requirement for wedding or live music. Um, you can get um, a spreadsheet from the event organizer uh, but it is up to you as the business owner to spot check or to check anyone uh, who is not on that um, spreadsheet um, to ensure that your business is compliant. Uh, so I've had another second question come in. Uh, weddings on private properties. Um, weddings are defined in the roadmap as weddings. Uh, and someone is asking when can weddings on private properties restart uh, and uh, because weddings are listed as an, as an event rather than a premise, uh, will those be able to resume both on public and private property at 70%? So West, that'll basically come in under the rules for what's allowed in a house. Um, so at the moment, you've got uh, limits where you can't have guests uh, in a household. So I'm just referring back to the thing. Um, and effectively, you know, once we get the ability to have visitors in the home, that's when you can have events at home as well. So it's really, it's the setting of the venue that overrides the purpose of the event. So it's not the, the function itself. So that, that, it's looks the like, that looks like 80% plus is when there'll be slightly increased uh, private property or 
home home weddings home events allowed that's right 30 visitors to the home is the expectation by christmas that's the that's what the roadmap sort of indicates okay um uh there's a question that's popped up in the chat about uh, phase c can you travel more than 25 kilometers uh, at phase C, um, so effectively, when we come out of lockdown, um, then there will be allowances for people to to travel unlimited. There won't, you know, regional and metro will merge, um, so there'll be movement of travel freedoms. You don't have to explain why you're moving around. It's just more the rules are for settings and workplaces as opposed to travel. Okay, and if the celebrant is the business that's conducting the entire wedding. Uh, will the celebrant be the one that's required to check vax status uh, if they're having a wedding that's more than the minimum number of people? Um, I think it's the, the wedding organizer. So it's probably, that's an interesting one because it's the venue operator as well. Um, so if they're having it in a hotel as opposed to a restaurant or trying to having it at a house um, outdoors, it, it really depends on the setting of the venue um physical no I, I understand that is a that is a tough question and i remember uh, in previous times like at home catering and you know it it whatever the business that was conducting the event ultimately became the responsible party because they had to have a covid safe plan and they had to ensure that even if it was in a home setting that uh, the patrons were following the same rules but um I, i'm gonna leave that one uh, uh, hanging because obviously that's a very specific question and you're right it does depend on the venue and um, if the celebrant is the business and the organizer or if the celebrant is an employee or contractor of the organizer um, it's ultimately up to the organizer I, I love it so many participants have stayed on this call um, many more than uh, I had expected uh, to get um, uh, we've answered that uh, there's a question there about the the paperwork needed to be signed. Um, uh, can a celebrant currently meet with a couple to get the NOIM signed in a public park or a picnic area? Um, that that's a bit of an odd question. Uh, or will that be at seventy percent? It relates well, to the fact that they have to travel greater than fifteen kilometers to do that at this stage. So I think you'd have to wait till you get that ability to travel um, beyond the limits. Uh, but having said that, the celebrant, if they're listed in a, as an authorized worker, then um, there's the ability for them to travel, uh, provided the couple live <laughs> reasonably close to each other. So, but so that it might all be possible, but it's uh, again a difficult one to have a blanket answer on. No, that's um, I'm certainly trying to get. All the questions answered and at the moment there are no more hugo have you had any email to you or estelle um had any email to you um i have not and uh my phone has been blowing up with a, a few comments but not questions uh so i want to thank uh joseph first thanking the minister um for coming on and um joseph and who has stayed on to answer some great questions and barb who uh, certainly typed many answers uh she was typing faster than then uh, I could keep up with answering the questions. And so she certainly has done an amazing job. And to KK for the back end for setting up the webinar, we always thank him. He does an amazing job here at Restaurant and Catering and Comms. Uh, and to Estelle for hosting and Hugo for prompting some great questions. And uh, yes, I'm sorry, I had to give out your email and I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of emails. Uh, we have... Um, uh, we do have a, a question about the state of emergency. So for, I, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna pass this on to Joseph afterwards, but for anyone who is reading into the state of emergency and incorrectly believes that somehow at the end of the 21st month that the pandemic in Victoria is over and the state does not have the legal authority to extend the declaration, um, the declaration because the state will still be under likely phase C, if not maybe phase D. Uh, the state, that state of declaration can end uh, and the premier and the parliament, state parliament has the legal authority to create another state of pandemic uh, and create a new one that will also 
have an extension date. So I know that there's many people that are hung up on that. Um, you know, the, the maximum time is 21 months. That was literally just for that state of emergency, not all states of emergency, just that state of emergency. But because we're still in a pandemic, because there were 838 cases today in Victoria, um, there is a 100% chance that that state of emergency will be extended. Um, it will be recreated with a new extension rules and, and uh, uh, maximum extension date on the other side. Now, Joseph, uh, you, I saw you shaking your head, but certainly uh, I wanted to definitively answer that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the answer will be yes. Um, I, this pandemic's not going anywhere just because we've said the roadmap, you know, gets us to December, which, and I think vaccination is obviously the key, which means we can manage this very differently to what we've done before, where we had a zero tolerance policy on um, COVID numbers. And some of the other things that will come up that will add some interesting twists to this is um, the arrival of international visitors, which is very important for the economy, for tourism, international students, for uh, economic travellers. And then we're going to also have, be grappling with booster shots, which is going to be an important one as well, as you've seen overseas. So, you know, this is not going away anywhere, but we'll learn to live with it and manage it and, um, and get the economy back. I mean, we're from, and the minister and, uh, you know, all of us from our department, we you know we're about getting the economy back and we will advocate and go hard now that we get to that vaccination population, then it'll become much more about the economics of things. And that's where we'll certainly um, go hard and go large in terms of getting the outcomes for, for you guys. And, uh, and Wes and his team works very closely with us on all of this. Yeah, so if you have any following questions, uh, please e email those to Estelle uh, or Hugo. Uh, it's Estelle at rca.asn.au or Hugo at, yes, they love me because uh, <clears throat> because I give out their emails. Oh, Estelle, thank you so much. Uh, and we will immediately pass those on and we, we try to get answers uh, within 24 hours. Um, and certainly there is no bad question. Um, there is no bad question. Um, we, we certainly can't answer the why questions uh, or you know, speculative questions about the future. Um, I don't think that there is a uh, minister or uh, public health official that can answer future questions. Um, we certainly are pushing as fast as we can to get to that 70%. And I know the minister is really, really pushing to get to that 80 by the 1st of November so that uh, Victoria can can enjoy some Melbourne Cup festivities, but it's very important that, um, that we're productive and that we're collaborative on this way forward. Um, there are now directions that say that staff authorized workers must be vaccinated. They are legal, uh, they are enforceable. Uh, I'm sure that they will be challenged, but that's a long and arduous process. And there have been zero wins for challenges to public health orders because the state is in a state of emergency and because the nation is in a pandemic. And so the expectation is that the public health orders will stand. Uh, certainly, um, you know, your employees and your suppliers uh, may have a different opinion, but it is very important that you're ready as a business for a fortnight from now when we expect to get to 70%. So be ready. Uh, read the fact sheets that we put out read the information that uh, the departments and the Victorian government puts out, uh, figure out how you're going to operationally make it work for you. Uh, and you'll have a much better experience from the, uh, from the let, let's call it the 26th, as the roadmap says, you'll have a much better experience from the 26th of October uh, if you are uh, engaging with us and with the department and the government with solutions. So thanks everyone uh, for this uh, great, um, webinar and I appreciate all the work that went into it. Uh, wonderful job, Estelle, Hugo, and KK. And thanks, Joseph. Thanks, Thank Liz. You. Thanks, Joseph.